Hi everyone um, and good evening. My name is Gronia Humphreys. I'm delighted to welcome you here uh, to the first of uh, an informal uh, group of, of, of kind of online events. I hope we'll do some in person actually called Div Circle. Um, just to remind you all if you can put yourselves on mute and that we actually are recording the session and we'll be um, putting it out uh, later on. Um, we have a fascinating, I think, double bill to use the old fashioned terminology. And um, so the first half is actually going to be a, a conversation with the three winners of the Aer Lingus Discovery um, Award for this year's festival. So I uh, will be talking to uh, Rena Column and Kate. Um, and then following that, in the second half, um, we are going to be meeting Tarek Shukri from Visit Films, um, a New York based sales agent. And we're going to be talking um, to him alongside um, Mia Malarkey, John Connors and Cara Holmes. Um, so it's two kind of, I suppose, uh, very different, but I think complementary conversations. Um, then, as I said, I'm delighted to, to welcome so many of you uh, to tonight's conversation. I suppose I wanted to really um, to thank, I suppose, um, Rainick and, and uh, Colm and Kate for being part of tonight's um, event because in a way this year's festival was a very difficult festival we were struggling with online and physical and and it was to my mind quite an emotional event but I think it also showcased some really fantastic films and I think sorry if you can put yourself on mute please yeah. thank you very much um, so I'm delighted that we get a little bit of a break of the summer and we're able to kind of come back and maybe with a little bit of perspective and, and time to kind of review um, uh, how the films that we screened in the festival in February um, have played and to catch up with them as, as filmmakers to see how they're getting on. Um, I'm going to give you their full um, biographies because I think it's really important, as I said, to kind of establish where our, our, um, our speakers tonight have come from. So I'm going to kick off with Colm, which is born in Dublin, raised bilingually through Irish and English. Over the past 15 years, he's directed a number of multi-award winning short films and many hours of documentary television for RTE, TG Cahar and TV3 Virgin Media. In 2012, Colm received a distinction from the Screen Directors Guild for his contribution to Irish language filmmaking. Um, Colm has made his narrative feature debut with on Colleen Kuhn, The Quiet Girl, an adaptation of Irish author Claire Keegan's celebrated story, Foster. The film premiered at the 72nd Berlin Alley, where it won the Grand Prix of the International Jury uh, of the Generation Plus program. It opened uh, our festival in February, winning the Audience Award and the Dublin Film Critics Circle for Best for Irish Film. He also received the Aer Lingus Discovery Award during the festival, and the film scooped seven Irish Film and Television Academy Awards, including Best Film, Best Director and Best Actress. Colm was also the recipient of the Screen Ireland IFTA Rising Star Award. And at the time of writing, the film has now entered its fourth month on release in Irish and UK cinemas, having earned almost 90, uh, 900,000 euros. Um, and Colleen Kuhn is the highest grossing, ir grossing Irish language of all time and one of the most critically and commercially successful Irish films of recent years. And most recently, it's been selected as Ireland's entry for the best international feature film at the 95th Academy Awards in 2023. Kate Dolan has graduated from the National Film School in 2012 and alongside with directing many commercials and music videos over the years in 2014, Kate was selected for Berlin Alley Talents where she wrote and directed short film, Little Doll. The film premiered at the Berlin Alley in 2016. Cat Calls, Kate's new, our next short film funded by Screen Ireland in 2017, premiered at many of the leading international film festivals, including BFI London Film Festival, Fantastic Fest and Fantasia. Um, Kate was chosen to take part in the Guiding Lights, the UK's mentoring scheme for filmmakers, and in 2019 was listed as one of Ireland's leading emerging creative talents under 30. Kate's debut feature, You Are Not My Mother, was released in 2022. It was... Uh, nominated for six IFTAs, including Best Script and Best Director, and Kate was also nominated for the Rising Star Award. And finally, uh, Rena McGuire, born in Dublin, Rena creates high concept film and TV projects from a subversive female perspective in a genre mold. She has a background in film and television uh, development, working as an executive for Blinder Films and Samson Films. Her films include Break Us, Neon, and most recently, Do, you know, do, you, uh, do I Know You in 2020, and Don't Go Where I Can't Find You in 2021. She's also the lead writer on The Lido, 
which is in development with RTE and Northern Ireland Screen. And Break Us went on to over three, uh, 30 international festivals, including Montreal's Fanta uh, Fantasia Film Festival. Uh, Don't Go Where I Can't Find You premiered at Vienna slash Fantastic Film Festival and won special mention at the Dublin Film Festival where it won the er where Renick won the Aer Lingus Discovery Award. Uh, it also screened in South by Southwest uh, earlier this year. So wow, is all I can say. When you read that kind of like list of credits, you're kind of like, oh, well, we're, we're in really, really good company. Um, I wanted to kick off with you, Renick, if I could. Um, partly because I'm I'm really curious about the the, the path in which um, uh, your short played. It had premiered already before it came to Dublin, so I'd love to to know where it went after that and whether or not you actually got a chance to travel with it. Um, yeah, it it um, so our first uh, premiere was in Vienna mm -hmm. at a really amazing, uh, fantastic film festival called Slash Film Festival, um, which screens. Like they have a really interesting curation of genre um, skewed films, but not you know always something just that little bit different as well and a bit left to field. And I I think the um, programmers there are just really really in intelligent and they create such a very unique experience um, that's quite fun for people who like genre. But also it's you know it's it it, it has a kind of um, just something you know, a little bit of an elevation as well. And it always is in these um, beautiful Viennese theatres, um, which it was really nice to experience. Um, and after that, like it it started to kind of, you know, it, it developed a little bit of a pace as well. Um, I got to go to Vienna. I got to uh, obviously come home to Dublin, which was great to have at home there. It was in Cork. Um, and then we were really lucky to get into South by Southwest, which took myself to um, Austin, Texas, which was a, a lot of fun. And I really, you know, I think once you hit a festival that size as well, and you have so many people watching your film, you know, it, it you, you're watching the film you made from a very different point of view with each festival, because each festival has its own different audience and unique experience and you know it was it was like watching a different film each time because you were watching it with audiences with very different tastes and things like that but it was a really great experience and many cowboy boots were bought and margaritas were drunk <laughs> and tacos consumed so um, it was a really great trip and felt very lucky to, to have to have gone to it as well um, but yeah I think it's you know and, and then after that we kind of pivoted to like think of the next thing as well so I think at a certain point you'd love to kind of keep traveling with your um with your film but you also are conscious of how expensive it is and that you need to get back to, <laughs> to work and think about the next thing as well so what what is the next thing so uh, or can so, you talk us around what you've been doing for around your life? the thing yeah, what yeah. you've been doing all summer Rena? <laughs> which might be the world's worst kept secret because I have told quite a lot of people before I realized that I couldn't talk about it but uh so I, I I've just come off a shoot hence my, shoot, very, hence my very like like worn look. worn look um and um uh it's so six straight days with some of the most wonderful human beings and actors that I've I, I've ever worked with um, really fun experience that we can talk about next week, um, but it's uh, it's very much uh, in the mold of things and themes that I like to kind of work with, uh, with new with a new production company, a new producer that I had the pleasure of working with as well. Um, but I think it's probably the most commercial um, project I've ever written and directed as well. So I'm I'm eager to get it out there into the world like the turnaround is going to be quite tight so it should be um on people's screens fairly soon hopefully wow um but uh and also kind of you know anxious and nervous and excited to see what the reception is as well and do you get any kind of break because i know you just you literally just finished it didn't you do, do i any... think i slept for you know yesterday and now we're cracking into the edit <laughs> this week <laughs> but you know I think that's exactly like what we were talking about before the call as well is you know I think when you do love what when, when you love what you do it's very hard to, to take those breaks and to kind of switch off for a moment and you know you're kind of eager to keep 
that pace up. So we'll sleep when we've when we've delivered, <laughs> or at least yes. we might roll on to the next thing. This is kind of fantastic, though. It's kind of <laughs> yeah. Anyway, anyone who's out there listening, this woman literally does not sleep. Do you know what I mean? Yep. If you hire her for a project, she'll just like work the whole way through. <laughs> no, don't, um, don't don't put that out there. <laughs> she likes to sleep sometimes. <laughs> I'm going to come back to you, Rina, when I'm going to ask you and I'm going to ask the others about about what they're what you're watching, what what films you might be watching, and anything that you're excited about, and and also if you have been getting back to the cinema because I kind of feel like that's kind of in a way, you know, why, why we're all here, you know, is, is, is that experience, at least in my perspective. And I'm going to move to you, Colm, because, you know, your, your amazing film had such an incredible impact on our opening night audience that, that everyone was in floods of tears. And, and it feels like that kind of impact has kind of continued over the summer. How, how has the, the Colleen Kuhn kind of, you know, stratospheric rise been for you to, to to watch and be part of yeah it's um yeah it's been kind of kind of crazy you know um you kind of you, you just you, you never know I guess when you make something like what what sort of impact it's going to have or whether it's really going to connect and um yeah it's just one of the I mean uh, in a way it's like uh, the way I think about it is like you know if you read Cl you read Claire Keegan's original like it's based on Foster her story and like I don't I've never I've yet to meet someone who's read that that work and not like fallen in love with it um so in a way i think like the film was like a vessel for that in a sense you know what i mean that it's and it's 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 obviously managed to capture the essence of what claire has had achieved and i think that's maybe explains why it has this sort of universal appeal you know because it is like it's a story set for anyone who hasn't seen it like it's set in in ireland in 1981 and it's essentially takes place on two farms like the action of the story um but like I, I, I really believe like you, that story could be set anywhere. You know, it could be, it could be in Africa, or it could be like in the outback or whatever, and you could still have the same, uh, you could still have the same elements of it, the same essential story, and I think it could be just as powerful. You know, but then I think it is obviously resonating with Irish people in particular due to all of the sort of elements that that they connect with from from our past, I guess. And maybe it says something about how we kind of communicate or fail to communicate emotionally as as a people. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's great though that obviously beyond our own shores, it's really connected with people. And um, like we just we won an audience award at the Taipei Film Festival in Taiwan, and uh, we went over to Sydney. We were playing at the Sydney Film Festival, and like it was really emotional like it was a standing ovation at the end of our screening in the state theater it's this lovely old 1920s theater it's like a thousand seats or something and um we were like up on stage like kind of in tears because everyone was just you know seems to be really moved by it. but uh, um yeah so it's been it's been yeah it's been crazy you know and obviously it's myself my, my wife cleona is the producer on the film so like it's very much the whole thing has been sort of all just channel through our house here in a way you know um and like we're run, it's our own company so like we're running everything to do with it and just in extraordinary I've, I've been amazed by like how extraordinarily busy you can be for so long after making a film um just in terms of festivals and distribution and publicists and just everything that comes with it it's uh it's been a real learning curve um but like an amazing an amazing thing to have brought from like literally sat here wrote the film like on this keyboard um and then actually edited the film here on the same computer because myself and john couldn't sit in the same edit suite because of covid but um yeah just to go from there to like everything that's happened it's just been extraordinary you know and um and obviously now with the the oscar selection there's a whole other sort of thing that has to kind of kick into gear now and uh that whole campaign is sort of sort of gearing up now so yeah we're going to be busy and what 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 is there a learning that you've had from this kind of experience do you know I mean that you know the next project will will benefit from is there something that you would have thought about do you know what I mean, that you've learned through because I, I feel like you've been through this amazing kind of cauldron of all these different festivals all this press all this kind of attention um you know is there anything there that you think wow do you know what I mean the next part the next time i'm going to do it in a particular way i don't know you know first yeah. class flights or i don't know <laughs> five star hotels how, how yeah do i don't know i find it hard to pinpoint any one thing but um 
I, I, it's more a case that I think about uh, while I was making Uncalling Kuhn that I kind of was doing it in a, from a place of such innocence in terms of not knowing all of this other stuff, which is probably a healthy way uh, to do your, your first film anyway. Um, but yeah, I find it hard to pinpoint like what exactly, I just feel it's just that kind of thing by osmosis that you sort of suck all this sort of stuff into yourself and it does sort of alter you slightly. And um, I'm certain that it will, um, you know, it will be there when I come, hopefully come to do another one, um, that there'll be, I will have learned and, or, you know, I will, have, I'll be slightly more mature maybe as a filmmaker or something. I'm not sure how to put it into words. And, and just harking back to what Renick was saying about the project of, of, of having to kind of say, right, that's there. I mean, have, have you been able to do work on another project or has, has you know, Colin Kuhn become a kind of full time kind of, I mean, with the Academy, presumably that's also a kind of campaign that will, you know, take up a lot of your time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, we have been sort of, you know, we're, we're very conscious of, you know, you hear stories of people who get sort of swept up in their films and sort of spend a year traveling with them and then get to the end and, you know, realize, oh, I haven't actually, you know, prepped something new or, so we have been uh, like submitting ideas for other features, you know, for Screen Ireland development. And we did get development funding for another feature, uh, which I'm kind of at the outlining stage now or like redrafting the treatment basically um, when I get time, but it is actually proving it's proving difficult, like, you know, just the amount of stuff that's that's going to come through. But um, I'm really, I'm really looking forward to kind of, you know, sinking my teeth into it again and, uh, and yeah, working on that. Brilliant. Gom, I'm going to uh, leave you to, to kind of come up with a couple of things that you're either watching at the moment or that you're looking forward to just to, to kind of finish off our, our session today. Um, Kate. Can I, I was highly amused what's called to, the, to, to see a tweeting after note, but I was kind of going, hold on. How is she actually in the cinema? Because you're working on one of the kind of biggest high profile kind of TV gigs of the year, I would have thought. So how, how is, I, I kind of have a vague notion what you've been doing for your summer, but tell me how, how the, you know, obviously the, the, the screening um, in the festival, I think was one of the last, I think before you went out on release, wasn't it? Yeah, so we we went on general release in the cinema a week after yeah. Diff, I think. Yeah. Um, so that was it. That was a tough release. We came out the same day as the Batman, so that was a uh, difficult. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, like, I it's kind of crazy to be here and be talking about Diff, and I'm like, oh, it seems like it was just last week, and I'm like, so much has happened actually since that. And now when I hear the guys talking, I'm like. Oh yeah, months and months have passed. Um, so yeah, it's been kind of mad, I suppose. Yeah, the film came out and then it was released in the States. So I got to go to LA for its release over there, um, which was really cool. And uh, it was received really well over there and um, did quite well on video on demand in the States and over here as well. So, um, and then it also, you're not my mother is also on Netflix now in UK and Ireland and it's on Hulu in the States as well. So it's kind of, yeah, been on a journey. It's like, it, it was funny, all the different stages of kind of festival and then cinema release. And then it, you kind of forget that um, there's a whole like realm of people that just discover your film for the first time when they see it on Netflix on the like, what's new or whatever. So then we, you know, it was kind of mad to see the tweets come in when you get put on one of those streaming platforms because it's just like a whole new audience that didn't even know your film existed that now are watching it. So we got into the top three, I think, of at the that week on Netflix of like most watched films, which was really cool. Um, and yeah, then I also, uh, I don't know when I would have done the interview, but I did a interview to direct a couple of episodes of TV, which I'm currently in prep on, and we start shooting in the 1st of September. So I'm going to be directing two episodes of Kin, uh, which is AMC, an RTE a show produced by Braun. Um, so that's been really exciting because I've never done any TV before. So it's kind of a learning experience, um, but very exciting and very different to obviously like directing your own project because you're you know, interpreting somebody else's script and 
especially because it's season two you're working with people and who've worked all together it's kind of like being the new kid at school you're like where do I sit <laughs> um so that's been um yeah it's been really fun though the team are amazing and the the whole team like the producers and the showrunner Peter McKenna and all the crew are great and they've just it's just been you know after coming from making an indie movie for absolutely nothing when you're told you can have two cameras working all day on set and like there's a steady cam whenever you want to use it just sitting there every day it's like it's sort of like that you're like whoa okay cool um so yeah it's been it's, it's been exciting that sounds fantastic hi just just to remind everybody if if you're not on the panel if i can ask you just to, to put your mute on kate can, tell me about moma because that's kind of fab yeah so we, um when uh cat calls or sorry when um you and our mother was being released in uh the us obviously there was like a lot of press involved like to, like, like a painful amount of press to do um but part of the press was actually uh a kind of i was put in touch with a woman called um karen coleman and she runs uh the future of film is female it's like a kind of organization that supports women in film female directors and writers um and she really took a shine to the film and she did um great q a for us and stuff when the film came out first but then she was curating a series of films for moma to play during the summer um highlighting horror so it was a kind of female directed horror was one strand and then i think they've moved on to the folk horror strand now and um, but we were included in her like um selection of female directed horror movies which was amazing because there was like some real classics in there as well and um some new movies that are brilliant as well so it was uh really cool to be included in that yeah no it's fantastic no i already saw that i thought geez that's great that's really cool because that 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 whole i know some of the curators in moma and they're they're really kind of like you know smart guys they're 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 also really kind of like tough do you know what I mean? I think to 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 kind of get into there, so it's 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 really it's really cool. Um, I'm as I said, conscious that I wanted to kind of just pick up on on what you've been watching and what you've maybe seen, and that you'd kind of like recommend. So, uh, Rena, can I start with you? I've given you the most time, so you have to. <laughs> I have to hop in, in first. Yeah. Uh, well, yesterday I um, you know, in, in that malaise of being the first day off um after a shoot and you can't really see beyond your own nose i managed to make it to the lighthouse to see nope uh and then later some boy ride as well and it just was kind of like it was you know when you, you you have those kind of days where you're exhausted and you just go to the movies um it you know it really does kind of bring you back home again and nope has been absolutely yeah it was uh, kate and i were talking about it yesterday that it was kind of like it's like Jaws, but in the clouds. It's like a proper old school monster movie. And it's a film for uh, people who love movies as well. And I think, you know, it's it was just such a great ride in the cinema as well. And of course, Joyride. I'm a um, big fan of Ema Reynolds um, and really like delighted for, for her that her first feature film has been um, such a kind of sweet little treat like that film as well. Um, and apart from that kind of um, watching Nathan Fielder's uh, the rehearsal and I think having worked with I got to work with an like a full ensemble of like 10 actors in this last week and you know had a big crash course in working with actors and watching that TV show has been sort of like a nice um, companion piece to the work I was doing is just kind of watching um, you know the, this show about actors and uh rehearsing real life situations and i'm getting and getting a lot out of it so far right that's fantastic look at dude i love the way we, i i just yeah i love going to the lighthouse but i do often laugh about the fact that you're just completely exhausted and you immediately take yourself <laughs> off to go to see no <laughs> just like go <laughs> yeah let's go you know colin have you had any time to get to see stuff at all uh i watched some movies like on the plane to sydney <laughs> I haven't been to the cinema. Yeah, I haven't been to the cinema in quite a while. I mean, we have two young kids as well, so that kind of makes life even more difficult. But um, 
Yeah, like, well, I'm kind of boring at the moment, I guess. I'm, I, I never saw the end of The Sopranos, so I just took a notion that I was going to watch all of The Sopranos. So I'm on, like, season five at the moment, uh, about halfway through. So that's kind of been my, my thing for the last, last few weeks. Um, but uh, what else? Like, I watched Prey, the, the new Predator movie. Um, really good. Is, yeah. It's good, yeah. I'm not, maybe not, I wouldn't be quite on the same page as Tara Brady with like the five star review in the times, but um, did it get five stars? Yeah. That's gas. Yeah. <laughs> for me, it's a four, but uh, it was very, it was very enjoyable though. Certainly the best since the McTiernan one. So, um, but yeah, apart from that, like, I don't know, three Sopranos, I was watching, uh, I was watching some, uh, Mizoguchi movies, the Japanese director, the 47 Ronin and Life of Oharu. And he's amazing. Like he's, mm. if anyone's never watched a Mizoguchi movie, they should seek him out. Like, it's kind of crazy. He's not as well known as like Kurosawa and Ozu. He's like, yeah. he's arguably better than both. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's what I've been doing. That's really, this is a really interesting list so far, I have to say. This is kind of like you're from Nope to Misaguchi. That's kind of like a really <laughs> impressive, guys. Come on, Kate, take it home. <laughs> no pressure. Um, no pressure. Um, yeah, well, as you said, I, I got to go see Nope. I actually, one of the perks of when you're a horror director that has had a movie come out, you start getting invitations to previews of other horror movies. So I got an email from um, my agent. They're like, you've been invited to a preview screening of Nope in Dublin. And I was like, absolutely. I 100% have to go to that. Um, and I am in prep on Kin. And you know what? I just was like, I'm not going to miss this at all for anything. So I went to that, which was really great. And they gave us these Nope hats as well that just say so Nope on them. Yeah, they're really cool. Um, but yeah, I loved Nope. I really enjoyed that. Um, what else am I watching? My girlfriend got a new iPhone at work, um, which got us three months free subscription to um, Apple TV. So we've been availing of that, which has been a lot of fun. So I've watched uh, uh, M. Night uh, Shyamalan TV series called Servant, which I really in was enjoying, and Severance with, um, I think, Aoife McArdle directed a few episodes yeah. of that, which is really cool. I'm really enjoying that. And then I started... Um, watching the boys on Amazon Prime um, I was trying to watch kind of like cool macho TV shows to prep for kin and uh, so I've been watching a lot more TV than going to the cinema lately which has um, been very enjoyable um, so yeah that's kind of it I guess I, I also watched um, a league of their own for the first time ever at the weekend because my girlfriend was like you've never seen league of their own and we watched that so that was an enjoyable very enjoyable evening as well <laughs> that's good that sounds great well there's loads of loads of recommendations so then uh any of you seen Irma Vep not yet I really oh, want yeah. to watch that yeah. actually yeah no. yeah that 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 really for me I just went oh no I'm sorry what's work do you know what I mean I'm just going to just, just wait until it's over and Alicia Vikander is fantastic yeah that's I've really heard good. I've heard yeah that's really good mm. um listen we've hilariously run out of time actually because I, I kind of said we kind of catch up with you and then literally as I said we're kind of now over our, our kind of like a lot of time but a huge thank you I mean I'm delighted as I said to hear that the films have gone on and gone to different places and 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 seen um and really I can't wait to find out the great unveiling of what the, the, <laughs> the new project is that's coming towards us so um, I built it up too much now <laughs> no 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 this is what this is all about um Colin best of luck we'll all be doing as much cheering and 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 um pushing and promoting Oh, I loved what you said, if anyone hasn't seen it. Is there anyone who hasn't seen it on this <laughs> island? Because I don't think there is, to be quite honest. Um, and listen, what's going on, Kate, will be, we'll be glued to the episodes of Kin when, when it launches, I presume, in the autumn, is it? Um, I think, I'm not sure, actually. It might be the spring. Oh. Oh, spring okay. um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not too sure. Anyway, we will, we, we will wait first, as I said. Can't wait to see it. I think... Uh, Joe and Christine are also doing a couple of, of yeah, of well. they're in the block that's currently shooting so that we had to swap a few scenes due to scheduling issues. So I was chatting to them. They're um, 
yeah, we were kind of trying to support each other as much as possible as people coming from kind of indie film to TV backgrounds. It's we like, really exciting. Yeah. It's really Joe Lawler and Christy Malloy. It's really exciting. Desperate optimist. So it'll be, it sounds yeah. brilliant. Listen, I'm going to love you and leave you. Thank you so much for joining us um, and for being part of this particular conversation. Um, and I'm going to uh, welcome now, um, who have I got? Have I got uh, John? I can see. Uh, so thanks very much, Rena, Colm and Kate. Thank, Thank you, you so got, much. Thank, Thank you. you. A million. Bye -bye. Um, and I have, I can see Cara. Hello. I can see Tarek. And Hello. I can see Mia. Fantastic. And I have John as well. Brilliant. Okay. We're smoothly moving over. Um, the second half uh, of tonight's um, event is really I, I'm really excited about it because in a way, I, I, I feel like for the last couple of years, I've spent a lot of time on one-on-ones talking to filmmakers about where they might go with their films and, and how to contact sales agents, what festivals they should aim for and how to structure uh, a festival strategy. And, and as I said, it was partly because I have always had a, a kind of summer or late summer conversation with our discovery winners that I thought maybe it would be a good idea to use this as an opportunity uh, to invite uh, a friend of the festival um, who we've worked with, God, Tarek, I think five or six years at this stage now we've been yes. um, screening uh, Visit Films uh, as part of the uh, Dublin International Film Festival. And then I thought, you know, much as, as Tarek and I would be fascinating, I thought we have to keep it real and we have to bring the real kind of like, uh, you know, I, I suppose connection and conversation into this particular um, piece. So I've asked, again, three friends of the festival, three filmmakers uh, to be part of this conversation um, to, to bring their perspectives, their knowledge, and indeed the projects that they're working on into this conversation, as I said, so that we can make this conversation um, um, with Tarek as, as real as we possibly can and, and cover some of the topics, some of the issues that face filmmakers making shorts and features and docs. And um, every time they, they, they kind of, feel like it's finished what do I do next where do I go and and what's the best way to um to kind of get that process started so um as I said I just wanted to give a brief um um bios for for our guests so uh, I've mentioned Tarek he's the director of festivals and non-theatrical um uh, for Visit Films a worldwide boutique film sales company and monument releasing a New York um based distribution company um, working with hundreds of venues annually, he's responsible for forming and executing the global festival strategy for titles that have gone on to win top prizes at festivals, including Sundance, Berlin and Locarno. And in collaboration with a roster of first rate filmmakers, including Joanna Hogg, Josephine Decker, Carlos Regadas, Koganada, Amelia Ullman, Mark Cousins and Theo Anthony. Uh, Tarek first developed his passion for film in college, heading the Ivy Film Festival, the world's largest student film festival, and founding the Brown University Film Forum, a weekly screening series. Since moving to New York, Tarek has worked at the Tribeca Film Festival and IndieWire, and served as a programmer for the inaugural edition of Tide Film Festival, celebrating the work of filmmakers of colour. Um, I'm going to kick off with, Tarek in, in, uh, with Tarek in a second, but I just wanted to mention, uh, as I said, just the credits of our, our panel. So uh, Cara Holmes is an award-winning film editor and director. She creates provocative, critical, and innovative documentary films. And her credits include Father of Cyborgs, Lost in Time, Welcome to a Bright White Limbo, and her forthcoming real art documentary film. Uh, Mia Malarkey is an award-winning film director and founder of Ishka Films. Uh, her credits include Throwline, Feats of Modest Valor, uh, Mother and Baby, uh, The Passion, and Safe as Houses, which recently premiered at the FLA. And John Connors is a, an actor, a screenwriter, an activist, a documentary filmmaker, and playwright. Um, and uh, some of his credits and some of the films that we screened in the festival include Endless Sunshine on a Cloudy Day, Innocent Boy, and um, he's got a forthcoming and um, feature, The Black Guelph. So that's our panel. I'll, I hope you agree it's a really interesting uh, group of people but I'd like to kick off with asking Tarek, if, if you would, to just talk a bit about Visit and give us a sense of the kind of company that it is, the kinds of films that it's interested in, um, and, and I suppose the, the engagement it has with filmmakers. 
Wonderful. Thanks for thanks so much for having me. Can you can you all hear me? Wonderful. Great. Thanks, Grania. As you, uh, I wish I gave you a shorter bio because you covered it. <laughs> um, but Visit is a, a boutique sales agency, one of the few actually based in the U.S. that handles uh, and focuses on director-driven work um, from around the world, really. And that that includes everything from emerging talent. A lot of our films are first, a second, and third time feature films um, to work from more proven and acclaimed talent. So we've worked to help establish filmmakers from their first films, um, such as the Safdie brothers and Eliza Hitman and um, Trey Edward Schultz, all the way to filmmakers uh, such as Werner Herzog um, and Carlos Regadas and Joanna Hogg, as you mentioned. Um, um, my role at the at the company, which is a, a sales company, is uh, specifically to establish the uh, the festival strategy and non theatrical strategy for these films as we are selling them uh, around the world to a variety of, of partners across all media, everything from theatrical distributors to uh, SVOD partners, broadcasters, streaming. Uh, ancillary rights. Um, so yeah, I, uh, we've been very privileged, of course. Uh, in my job, I get to uh, pitch our films uh, and speak with programmers from hundreds of film festivals and non-theatrical venues around the world. Um, and we've been lucky enough to share a lot of them at Dublin International Film Festival, uh, everything from Good Madam and Superior last year, uh, countless before then. I know off the top of my head, we had Dinner in America recently, Hearts and Bones, Tana, which had a, a had an Oscar nomination back in 2018. Uh, good favor that includes some Irish films. So they're films from all around the world, um, but a lot of the focus is on American independent films. That's great, Tarek. Can I, can I, and I, that's really comprehensive actually, but I'm, I'm kind of interested to, to kind of bring it down to, I suppose, the, the kind of micro level about how you see films. Do you know what right. I mean? And, and is it, is it you're going to festivals or is it, you know, in, in tandem with, with, you know, films coming in as submissions to you? And people yes. So um, what's great about Visit, I think, is uh, we really prioritize uh, director driven films, as I mentioned, so it, it's project dependent, but we usually like to see we we, we acquire films at all stages uh, of development and completion, so we might be tracking a film quite early and get a film. Um, usually we like to see more packaged films scripts with directors at least half of the finance is in and that can be our first point of entry just so we know where this film will be made um, and then we can um, take a look at the script see some early footage um, and decide to come in then but there's also a lot of the times we're coming in after a film has already um, well on its way to being completed. We'll see it at a rough cut or final cut stage. And if we really love the film and uh, we join it then, we can help land that A-list premiere uh, if it's out there or land the appropriate um, film festival premiere. Um, then there is also always a few films that slip by us and then they already have a film festival that they're um, excited to premiere at. And we might, we'll, uh, we'll generally want to see it um, before that premiere so we can help um, launch the sales process from that point on. Um, but it really, we don't take, like, we don't prioritize any genre, any type of film specifically. It's really about films that are, are really personal, um authentic um and have their own um style and uh yeah it, we we love to work with all, all kinds of films and can you tell me i mean is there one that you could maybe take us through that you right. would have joined at a particular point because i'm really curious about it you know that i know as a as a programmer it's very difficult to watch something that's still being worked on do, do you know exactly. what I mean? to try and make a decision. So I'd love to hear that from your perspective, yeah. how you evaluate and make decisions about things. 
Of course, I can. Uh, there are a couple of examples I have in mind. We had a film. Um, this is one, on one end of the spectrum called Ascension uh, that world premiered last year and actually uh, it, it eventually earned a best documentary nomination at the Oscars. So it was a big success story for us. But this is a film that our um, we began working on back in 2017. I was barely at the company. I was a year into the company and uh, we picked this up because um, we we were tra we were sent uh, a short film uh, called Commodity City, um, and we knew that that film um, Jessica Kingdon, who's the director, was working on her first feature. Um, it's a it was an observational documentary in in China that uh, is kind of this kaleidoscopic. Um, and more experimental film, and they were spending time going from uh, different places to different places in China, looking at like um, the industrial supply chain um, from the bottom up. Um, and we joined that film quite early on and took a more hands-off approach, uh, just because we were so enamored by um, the director's short and we saw the vision there um, and took a chance because that documentaries can take years as you saw and eventually we were able to place it at, at a world premiere in Tribeca which helped facilitate a sale to MTV documentaries and meanwhile um, I was able to program it all around the world because they, they didn't really have uh, anybody who was doing that all around the world. They were focused on an awards campaign domestically. Um, and that was a great example. And then on the flip side of that, there are films that like El Planeta, which is a film that um, played in Sundance last year. Um, this is a film that we were in touch with producers on um, because uh, the director, Amalia Ullman, who's, who was more known as a performance artist before, uh, she, uh, some of her friends uh, had worked with us and had um, um, heard about how great uh, the experience was working with Visit. Um, and she had already gotten into Sundance when we began having those conversations with her directly and her producer partner at Memory. And uh, Memory is a production company we worked with um, on rat film and we've worked with in the past. Uh, so having those established relationships can also help um, even uh, at a kind of late stage when you're about to premiere, if it's the right fit, um, uh, we're happy to look at it then. And just as a general rule of thumb, when you're approaching sales agents, uh, a lot of the time it's about when is the right time to approach them. It, it really depends, um, but it, a lot, I'd say sales agents won't always have the time to see your project more than once. So when you feel very confident in it, um, whether that's at a rough cut stage or you want to wait till it's a more final cut stage, um, just be aware of when you're sending it uh, because sometimes they'll only have the chance to, to look at it one time and you want to put your best foot forward. Uh, Tarek, we've already get questions into the chat, which I'm going to pass on to you, but I'm also just going to just prep my, my, my colleagues on the panel and say I'm going to hand over to you in a minute now, so get your get your questions ready. But the question from the chat is about whether Visit takes films that have already premiered on the circuit. So maybe right. you could answer that one. Of course. Um, it's, it's rarer, but we definitely do, uh, especially right after a world premiere, or at least a world premiere has been decided. Um, it, it really depends on, on the film. It's film specific, I would say. Uh, but uh, if we fall in love with the film, we'll definitely... Um, will definitely um, consider it. Uh, I would just say uh, for sales agents, as soon as a film starts um, being in film festivals, it starts to age in the eyes of distributors uh, and it starts to age in the eyes of sales agents for better or for worse. Uh, so the more work we can do before um, and prepping it for a big launch, um, the better. And uh, a festival premiere is different from a market premiere. So let's say a film world premieres at Dublin in February. Um, maybe we hadn't been on the film yet, um, but we can launch it at a market premiere and at the Marche de Film uh, 
three months later in Cannes. And that still gives us uh, a way to present it as a brand new project to distributors, to buyers, and to other festivals. So funny, yeah, that, the word premiere. <laughs> Such, right. such a thorny, difficult world. I feel like everyone changes it when, they, when it, it exactly. works for them. You know, it's fantastic. Um, uh, John, Cara, Mia, do you yeah. have any questions that you'd like to, to ask Tarek? Um, yeah, I have one. I'm wondering about like the conversations that you would have with a director and a producer in terms of their aim for the film. So whether or right. not they want to go on to turn a short into a feature film or whether or not they want to stay as a team and kind of build off the first film or like what how you would complement what they're looking for from the film obviously everyone's looking to get into the top festivals and get an award but beyond that what kind of conversations would you guys have with the team of course yeah i mean we're all we're in constant contact and communication with the film filmmakers and um uh, one of the benefits of course of having a sales agent is they can focus on the filmmakers can focus on making their next work and we don't want to get in the way from that we want to do our work from the contacts we've gained over the years um uh so you have more time um and like, it's great, of course, if you have your own contacts and distribution at festivals and we welcome all of that uh, and we'll work alongside you. Um, especially I, this happens for me because I handle film festivals. It happens all the time where I reach out as soon as we pick up a film, let me know every festival you've played, what experiences have been the best for you. Uh, I l really want to make sure um, uh, filmmakers are able to to renew those relationships to attend film festivals that they've had their work played in. Um, as far as it goes for me when I'm booking film festivals, I, I generally look for film festivals that will either offer an invitation to the filmmaker to travel and come out and because that's a, a huge part of getting your film into festivals, um, making contacts and networking at those festivals um, and if they can't invite the filmmakers I'm looking to either um, get a screening fee um, um, or a also um, if a film is in competition for a cash prize I can of course waive a screening fee um, when when that makes sense uh, so it's usually looking at one of those things but I'm always in constant communication if there's a uh, a film festival that they'd rather play or hold a premiere for um, will weigh the pros and cons depending on the, the circumstances. Um, but we take that, um, take all input and help help you um, present your film as you want it to be presented. Great, thank you. Actually, on that, Tarek, because one of the things I'm conscious about is is that that notion where people always feel like there's um. There's an alumni and there's a relationship. I mean, do you do you keep in contact with filmmakers whose work you're showing? Do you know what I mean? And and kind of check in with their next one. Does that kind of build exactly? Up? Yeah. So we definitely um, we we love to retain our filmmakers. Uh, the nature of of our company is sometimes um, our filmmakers go on to much bigger <laughs> things. So uh, occasionally uh, a filmmaker will um, have its debut film or first two films um, working with us and then uh, a studio might um, um, be financing their next project and we won't work on that but we will definitely stay in touch. Um, my job isn't just booking um, for the first year to 18 months of a film's life but we have a back catalog of 200 films so I'm still booking um film I'm still booking Joanna Hogg's films exhibition and arranged uh, uh exhibition and yeah uh unrelated uh, I mean um f to any place that hasn't ha sold um theatrical rights so uh that can be museums, cinematechs, universities for the life of the film. And we're continuing to have conversations with those filmmakers, tracking what they're doing next. And we always want to build a relationship um, with filmmakers and hopefully we can work on multiple films, which we've done numerous times. It's funny that you mentioned Unrelated because I actually remember exactly where I was. I was in a bed sit in Donnybrook 
at 7.30 on a Saturday morning <laughs> and I watched it on a VHS. My God, I feel like 109. But I'm really interested about that dynamic, about, about, right. about Visit and filmmakers. Do you handle publicity? Do you, do you know what I mean? Or, so or we support? You know, I'm, we, I'm yes. kind of curious about what you do for filmmakers who get into Sundance, for instance, etc. How much you're you're kind of elevating those kind of premiere screenings? Of course, yeah, we have we have um, a marketing and publicity um, person on our team who uh, is in charge of creating creating those elements and sometimes that is in collaboration with the filmmakers if they have a very specific vision for for the way they want their film to be um, portrayed at the film festival so that can be creating poster and uh, teaser or trailer elements and um, getting um, a press release put together um, that might premiere a, a poster or trailer element but a lot of the times like those elements will will vary from um depending on who you're trying to go out to so uh a poster for sales that we might um be putting up in a booth in can could be different from the vision that the filmmaker might have for their film and even like a film festival um focused poster um uh, just because you're slightly going out to different audience, depending on the film, of course, some films are more commercial than others and you you'll have a more commercial poster or trailer. Um, but we are working hand in hand on creating those elements. Um, we're putting things on social media, everything like that. And do you do you agree if fee? I'm just curious as to how, it, how do you do you agree a fee or is it a percentage of the kind of screening fees or the sales? Do you know what I mean? What, right. Is there, a, is there a rate card that you'd be happy to share or an indication of what you know the the, the terms might look like? Yeah, I'd say I mean the, generally when you're um, reaching out to a sales agent, uh, they'll always be different factors in the agreement, everything from territory and term, um, uh, that's like the year length that they'll be working on behalf of your film. Um, and then the sales fee, which um, it can range depending on the, the kinds of rights you're selling. So let's say you already have distribution in your, your home country. So it'd be mm -hmm. worldwide excluding, let's say Ireland. Yeah. Um, uh, sales fees can range from a, a, around 15% to 25%. And then uh, it really, that's, that's kind of the norm. But just keep in mind that the, the, the higher the sales percentage, sometimes sales agents will be very motivated. <laughs> um, and then if, if you agree to, if a sales agent isn't offering much at all, uh, it might um, take a back seat. So um, generally that's just um, a normal amount so that the, the sales agent will see that much of the sale. And then um, festival revenue is slightly different. Sometimes that's 50-50 mm -hmm. um, just because those numbers are way lower than the sales numbers um, for, for like a worldwide deal or um, a, a cross-country deal. I'm going to ask you some questions actually about, you know, the, the, the shifts in the landscape that you've seen yeah. you know, because it feels like there has been quite significant changes towards you know, distribution or television or, 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 or streamers. But I'm conscious I haven't asked um, either John or, yeah. or Cara if they have any questions. Yeah. So in both of you have new projects. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd love to ask a question actually. Um, I suppose film freeway is a great like mechanism for filmmakers, right? Um, and it's very convenient. However, right. there's no real account accountability on it because there's no analytics, so you can't really prove if a festival has actually watched your film, right? Which I, think, I think should be the very least for a film festival if they're going to take in your the fee that they're going to pay. Um, that's why with some of the more elite festivals, you want to call them that. Um, you have to send a single link now, if right? Video, exactly. Whatever, you can actually prove if they've watched it or not. And I can prove some festivals have not watched my film. Uh, but anyway, uh, aside from that, what can we do to ensure the festivals watch our film? And how important really is it um, to get a sales agent on board, particularly when you're going for some of the bigger festivals? And also, sometimes are you better off going for a kind of less prestigious festival and get more of an embrace 
rather right. than a bigger festival and being ignored in a, in, a, in a big program full of, you know, superstars? I think that's a great question, and it touches on a lot of um, things that I wanted to speak uh, about today. I, I think, first off, the first note of Film Freeway, I think that's when you're a filmmaker and uh, that's a great resource to see what um, festivals are out there and what's popping up. But um, my advice is always to do your homework and um, um, just tread lightly um, with, with um, Film Freeway, for example, because there are more and more festivals popping up. Um, so if you do your homework by just looking into uh, their track record, their their programming in the past, make sure um, you're finding um, film festivals that will help you and you're not just um, sending indiscriminately out there. Because unfortunately there are some um, festivals that, that prey on naive filmmakers and are just trying to get you to pay money. And like you said, some won't even watch the film. That's one of the benefits um, for having a sales agent because they've built contacts over countless years with programs they know who specifically to get your film to um which um which different sections there are in each festival um that it might be a a better fit for for your film um and uh yeah just in general when you're obviously film festivals um need uh, submission fees to sustain themselves. Uh, that said, if you're paying, if they're asking you to pay more than a hundred dollars for a feature, and it's not an A-list festival that you you've uh, you know uh, the value of, um, you should probably compare the fees of different film festivals and um, just create a budget for yourself to see what are the best uh, festivals that will give yourself the the best chance for a fair price. Um, uh, I will say you'll have a greater deal of success working with a sales agent to make sure your film gets shown or gets watched. Um, um, although all reputable film festivals ideally should be at least what, having somebody, whether it's a pre-screener or a programmer, watch your film in its entirety. Um, I won't say that's always the case, but that's that that is the ideal. Um, and visit films, for example, we use a, a secure screener system for that reason um, that we will send links out and we get the analytics. We get an email notification every time it's been clicked and can see for how long it's been watched. Um, and that's how we know when to follow up more directly or when there are changes to the cut, we can send, uh, just replace the file internally and then send a note that um, the, the film now has complete color correction and so forth and so on. Um, yeah, so just in general, doing your research uh, a bit. Um, and film festival is kind of navigating a sea of rejection for better or for worse, unfortunately. Um, but you don't want to take things too personally because there are so many different reasons why a film might not get into a film festival. Uh, there are um, a lot of intangible elements and from year to year programming mandates change. Um, so yeah, just be cautiously optimistic um, and know which film festivals are the right fits for your film. Cool, Tarek, thank you. And just, just to kind of follow up a bit on that, um, what can a sales agent do to build, like, uh, to build a relationship with a festival and, and how can that sales agent actually help? Of course. Yeah, I mean, that's my job. A lot of the job, it seems like there's this grand mystique um, to getting into some of these festivals. But at the end of the day, uh, the programmers watching your films are, are just people. Uh, they're f film lovers. That's why I love my job, because uh, I get to travel to film festivals and markets and talk about the films that I love with the people, people that are like minded to me or at, have different tastes, but I get to know them on a personal level. Um, we talk about films. I know the ins and outs of their various programs, sections. I know which niche film festivals exist that might be 
might not be exactly on your immediate radar. So um, like whether a festival is more focused on experimental documentaries or a festival, uh, there's a festival that um, caters to first and second time feature filmmakers from Europe, or uh, there's a festival focused on Jewish film or uh, films that uh, are about filmmakers or subjects with disabilities. There are all kinds of niche film festivals that um, I work with. And um, generally, uh, it's our job to, to develop these relationships, to know how to pitch your film um, while you can um, work on your your work and um, work on your next films because uh, any any time taken away from that um, um, leaves you less time to work on your film yeah thanks Tarek. of course do you work with shorts at all or is it all features for us it's mainly features there's a, on a case by case basis we'll work on shorts uh, sometimes from from alumni or but generally it is features that said like i was mentioning with ascension um, shorts are a great indicator for us um, as to how a feature might turn out and we um, definitely when we're receiving materials we love to get pitch books with uh, a very personal touch, um, getting to know the filmmakers and any links to any short films are, are very welcome um, to give us a sense for, for what is to come. Farrakh, you mentioned um, maybe not sending rough cuts in too early, which is probably very sound advice, but um, uh, you know, how do you, how do you really start that, that relationship with the sales agent um, and then how do you, I suppose, like sustain it? Um, right. But. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say uh, a rough cut is, is, is not, is the, not the way to go when you're approaching a sales agent because you have to start somewhere and sales agents are at the end of the day, they're, they're here to help. Um, so it might seem very daunting to, to reach out and you don't want to blow your one shot, but it's more, I'd stress that you are confident in the stage that it's in. Um, and if a rough cut, you expect to get significantly better in a short amount of time and, uh, there's no big time crunch uh, for a, a film festival that may be your top target. You can always wait till next year. I, that's another thing I'd recommend uh, just in general. You don't wanna send too late to your top uh, festival uh, if the film isn't ready yet, cause they'll generally not reconsider it the following year. Um, that's just a side note. But as far as reaching out to, to sales agents, um, I think, um, yeah, I, you just want to give them a sense of the the project, what makes it personal, what makes it unique, uh, trying to think broadly while still like being authentic to yourself and avoiding cliches. Um, and uh, whether it's a cold email reach out, that's one thing. But if you have contacts that anybody who has worked with um, that sales agent, you can kind of um, be introduced that way. Or if you are fortunate enough to be at a f film festival or market um, where a sales agent is, um, just reaching out and trying to schedule a meeting is a great first point of entry. Um, and sustaining that relationship is um, checking in without um, being like, plaguing them with your with your emails because you don't want to overstay stay your welcome but you still want to be proactive um in in your follow-up um and generally a sales agent can give you a sense if it's the right fit for them um or not based on um the first uh, material you send so uh, you'll know whether or not it, it's in your interest to to keep pursuing them on that project and if it doesn't work for that project there's always the next project yeah um you used um i suppose the words niche and experimental which is always kind of good to hear and i was wondering like um specifically i suppose with vi visit films and then your relationship with festivals in you know in a kind of maybe feature documentary world with experimental or docudrama and stuff like that like do you, you um you obviously try and find the the best festivals the best audience for right. that film then yeah 
Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, taking into consideration all aspects of what makes that film unique and whether it, to some, it uh, uh, an experimental film might be it like I know the festivals where it's like they don't don't even bring it to me I also know the festivals where um they're really uh audience friendly um and the the film audiences love an experimental film so knowing those those niches to pursue um and helping guide like a which film festivals premiere um because the the film th world premiere is generally where you'll get the most buzz and the most uh, media coverage out of that film festival. That's something we uh, really stress, um, finding the right home for the first launch of the film. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. A um, couple of questions here for you, Tarek. Um, how much does Visit take into account a film's social media and um, when evaluating or looking at it? Um, it's always good to have, um, I, th I think it's a, a plus to have the social media for the film. In general, this is the same kind of material you'll be submitting to a sales agent when pitching your film. You'll have some, um, some um, stills, uh, maybe a temp poster, um, some onset photography is something a lot of filmmakers sometimes overlook, but it, it goes a long way. Um, onset still photography. That said, we're not ever um, taking a film just because they have like a, a huge social media presence. Um, um, that is as a benefit if it comes with a built-in um, following or audience for the film, but um, I, I, I wouldn't say it's something we, we're looking at the film itself and the project itself way more than social media. Another one here, is it okay to withdraw or postpone? Oh, hold on, uh, if it's all right, uh, is it all right to withdraw a film from a film festival after you've selected and tried to negotiate to postpone the screening for the next year? Um, just for clarity, is this a saying, is, is it okay to withdraw? Oh. Um, if from you a, think there's a better festival to apply in a given region or city that requires a local right. premiere, but you've applied to a, to a local festival. I'd recommend um, against uh, it if you can. Obviously, things come up. If your film festivals understand if uh, you have to decline an invitation. Um, but I would just recommend before submitting to festivals, make sure if you know that you're not going to play a festival until you've heard back from a different festival following them, um, I wouldn't say you should submit uh, until the following year because there's there's no real point in um, um, going out to film festivals if you can reapproach them the following year for the first time. Like I said, a lot of film festivals won't uh, take a film that they've invited. If you have to decline it, they won't just take it for the next year um, and they will only evaluate it one time. Um, but that being said, um, if there's a much bigger film festival, people understand why you would decline it, decline for it if, if you weren't anticipating um, that yeah i would say and just go back to something when you said the programmers were were people too and um, of course I, I would absolutely echo that and say that you know it's amazing what you can do if you create a relationship with a programmer yeah. or a sales agent and and the tone of your email changing your mind <laughs> right. i'm thinking in particular of one person who i will oh, be very course. resistant because of the way in which it was communicated do you know what i mean i mean yeah. as you said we all live in this world and we're all very aware of the pressures and the timelines and stuff. So, you know, an email that kind of, as I said, grabs you on a Sunday morning and tells you the bad news, you're like, eh, really? Yeah, of course. Well, no, I mean, it's, right. it's people know the difference between being genuine and not. Uh, and there are, to there are many reasons why you might not be able to play a film festival that are perfectly legitimate. Um, but just to, to agree with what you're saying. Um, yeah, the way you pitch your film, uh, if you just make it personal, if you know um, what a film festival is about, that will help you um, pitch your film. Um, 
maybe talking about some film uh, they've programmed that has really inspired you. Uh, one of the cardinal sins is uh, sending a, a film to a film festival and forgetting to change the name of their festival, which I'm sure you've seen countless of the copy and paste and you've forgotten um, to to correct your, your error there. So um, yeah, just making it genuine and personal, uh, um, whether it's through a sales agent or if it's through you yourself and you're reaching out, um, um, that's all sound advice. Yeah, the odd compliment has never hurt anyone. And um, could yeah. you ask Tarek about his thinking on a proof of concept film we're planning at this time? Oh yeah. Great. Well, we, uh, that's a little early um, for us that we generally uh, join projects, but for anyone that's interested in anything I've had to say, we, our acquisitions team, like, uh, inspects the account info at visitfilms.com, and I'm not on the acquisitions team per se, I help out with that, um, but that's where I direct anybody for, for proof of concept for anything. Great. I'm conscious that we're coming up to the end, but I wanted to ask you when you mentioned about festivals, because I, I kind of feel like it is really interesting that there's there, there's so many and it's growing, but are there right. specific festivals that you would feel happy to mention in relation to kind of certain genres that you of feel course. aren't necessarily the target one, you know, because I feel like everyone aims for, you know, Sundance yes. or Cannes or Berlin, and there's lots of other festivals that I think would, you know, deserve their, their little spotlight, particularly, as I said, when they are more, maybe more open to new voices than, than some of the, the kind of A-list festivals. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I, it just goes along with um, what I was saying about being realistic, because, uh, of course, everyone wants to play the top list A-list festivals like Sundance, Cannes, Berlin, um, TIFF, um, but there are a very limited number of slots um, for all of those festivals. So um, um, yeah, you should definitely uh, tune into the kinds of festivals that can help launch your film. Um, let's say you have a, a, a genre film or a horror film. Um, maybe a, a world premiere at, at Fantastic Fest or Fantasia in Montreal. Sitges, if you're staying in Europe, is, is one of the top premieres um, for a genre film festival. That's an example. Um, for, for documentary film festivals, if you're like, uh, like the, the film that we have, Ascension, that was nominated for uh, an Oscar last year, it, we didn't get into Sundance because it was, uh, it was a little too experimental and they, they didn't have a slot for that that year. But we, we landed in competition at Tribeca and won the best documentary there. If you don't get into Tribeca, there's always uh, Hot Docs, there's uh, a Sheffield, of course, um, IDFA, and these can launch a, a film and, and help reach the same industry um, um, that a film premiere at Sundance might land. Uh, there's a great film festival called True False in Missouri um, that always is um, really focused on bringing in the filmmakers um, and having the audience there. Uh, they're, they're such a film-loving and devoted audience. Um, and uh, word of mouth can spread right there with a few great reviews and create uh, a wonderful trajectory for, for a documentary film. So, so there are definitely plenty. Um, and one thing I'd recommend to do is if you're not sure exactly um, how, to, like, how to find the right film festivals for you, um, always look for comp titles. Um, and uh, do a, a bit of a market study independently yourself. So if, if there's another experimental um, or more niche uh, Irish doc, maybe it's not in the, sa the exact same kind of film as yours, but um, uh, there's one I know, Million Dollar Pigeons, I believe. Um, um, just look at what festival locations it landed. And you don't have to follow the exact trajectory, but uh, build up a list and a calendar, I'd say, for uh, 12 to 18 months where it's like, this is the ideal um, 
world premiere destination, but these are all of the other fe regional festivals that maybe don't need, uh, 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 don't care about premiere status. M maybe that it's okay if it's played uh, multiple times in Ireland already, uh, or um, like there are, there are film festivals in Asia looking for your Asian premiere, looking for your Australian premiere, um, and seeing where those comp titles have played will help you um, just build out a list for yourself um, and give you ideas that you might not have originally had. Um, so yeah, that's all, all advice. I'm coming to, we're coming to the end, but I have two very quick questions, um, Tarek. One is, is it only because I want you to say it about images and the importance of having good stills and yes. what you do with a good still and how it's nearly impossible for festivals to sell a film without it. So right. that's the first thing I want you to say. But the second thing is, is if there is any kind of insights that you'd have about the kind of dynamic of, of, of kind of like streamers or acquisitions. I mean, obviously, you know, festivals with markets, um, you know, are, are, are you know, kind of key places uh, to, to kind of think about in terms of getting your um, uh, your film, do you know what I mean, out right. there. But are, there, are there any other kind of tricks of the trade that you, you, you could pass on to people who are kind of saying, look, you know, I have a limited budget, I'm absolutely, you know, kind of gung-ho to get people to see my film. Is, is, it, is it market screenings or one-to-ones that you think is the best? Right. Um... I, on your first question, stills are very important. Um, uh, having a key still or two, uh, it's something that we use in all of the material that goes out. When I send a film to a, a festival, I'm also including a PDF card with a main still on it and maybe a temp poster on it. Um, and that's the first thing people see. People will see that before they watch your film. So it's a, it's really all about first impressions. Um, and as far as um, uh, when sales agents in particular attend uh, markets and they have a booth, uh, that still is what will draw people's eyes too. When they walk into your booth or they're just passing by, they might notice um, a particularly striking image. Um, and you can you can kind of gain a, a, your traction based on your main still alone in a lot of in a, in a lot of cases. So yeah, to reiterate what I said, on set photography sometimes people are just they're too busy to do it, but it really can help. Um, um provide a, a, a vantage point to, to see your film in a different light um and i'd recommend that uh and similarly posters will um involve the still and, uh, and all of that as far as your second question um i would i mean my job is fe film festival so i'm still will will stay um resolute in that film festivals can can are really a wonderful and essential in getting eyes on your film, both audiences and also opening up the eyes of um, industry. And a lot of industry now, because of the shape of the world, they might not be attending the film festivals physically, um, which is a key difference. And the market has changed it and it's sh shifted, um, but film festivals will still give it the exposure even if a, a buyer is watching a film on an industry portal across the world um, at, at their own um, at, in their own bedroom, um, they'll still um, know that having gotten into a certain festival, it gives it a, a, a sense of prestige. It gives them a reason to watch the film um, and to take it seriously. Um, and that's that's a, a, just like a great benefit to to a filmmaker to have those people. And then of course the audience word of mouth um, is is something that's so special. And sharing your film on a big screen with an audience is is the most exciting experience a filmmaker can have. I'm sure. Um, as far as um, one on one convos go. Uh, I'd say if you're able to travel to film festivals, having those con conversations is, is definitely um, 
uh, it, it, I'd say it is more valuable um, than not being able to meet somebody because you really get a sense for who they are, what their company is, um, and you can you can work on that front. But uh, yeah, setting up zooms if there are zoom panels at uh, at festivals or you reach out for a personal zoom too that that works just as well yeah that's fantastic listen i'm conscious of of people's time and and i i think you've kind of covered lots of kind of information there um thank you so much um tarek for for all your insights and 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 kind of uh, as I said, kind of insider knowledge about about the kind of sales agents kind of like process. And, and again, I'm, I'm kind of conscious that, you know, every year people have different projects or every two years and it is about right. keeping up. One of the things I think do think is really important is sales, film festivals change and the people who are programming them change and right. genuinely keep on top of that are sales agents and they know all those inflections. But equally, right. you know, that that's that's a you know a, a, a relationships aspect but listen thank you so much and, and again thank you for all your sort of like insights and guidance and i look forward to finding out what what kind of visit films we might be screening in next year's festival. i know that's, i can't wait that's another conversation a, yes. big, a big thank you to john and to cara and to mia thank you so much for for being part of the conversation and kind of as i said bringing the filmmakers perspective into it because again um right you know, Film festival sales agents and filmmakers are all part of a kind of continuum. And um, I know that we have um, gone over our time limit, so I'm gonna, gonna stop now in a second, but I did wanna say that we had kind of offered as well if people wanted to, uh, to kind of discuss more about um, festival strategy that we were happy to offer some opportunities for anybody who's listening to, to kind of discuss their film with me. Um, at a time so please use my my the email is office at diff.ie and, and we can schedule them there we have some places available other than that i'm going to draw the first diff circle to a close and say uh, thank you all very very much and uh, Tarek, i will see you soon and john yes, Clara, and me i will see you soon as well take care everybody and uh, i'll see you in the thank cinema you. thank you so much thanks all take, take care bye bye